Well, welcome along to today's edition of the show. And do make sure to like and subscribe today's video if you're watching on YouTube. We've got loads more great debates in the archive and many more to come. You might even want to subscribe to our newsletter to get regular updates on the show, listen to the podcast and get all the bonus stuff you get as well by becoming a newsletter subscriber. Today on the show, we're talking about the Enneagram and asking, should Christians embrace the Enneagram? Uh, What is the Enneagram? Well, it's a system that describes nine personality types and the patterns of how people interpret the world and manage their emotions. It's a personality tool that's become wildly popular in the last few years in both secular and spiritual circles. But some Christians are split over whether it's a helpful way of understanding human psychology that can be a blessing for Christian ministry or a dangerous Trojan horse for occult spiritualism that should be rejected. Well, joining me today are Todd Wilson and Marcia Montenegro. Todd Wilson is president of the Centre for Pastor Theologians and his new book, The Enneagram Goes to Church, claims that the same tool that has helped many people grow in self-awareness can be applied to life in faith communities with transformative effects. Uh, Marsha Montenegro is a former astrologer who left the New Age movement after converting to Christianity. She runs a ministry called Christian Answers for the New Age. And her recent book, Richard Raw and the Enneagram Secret, explains why she believes the Enneagram is actually a spiritual deception being foisted on the church by influential leaders. So I'm really interested in today's show. I've been hearing so much about the Enneagram in the last few years. Not sure I fully understand it still, um, but hopefully Marsha and Todd can help me too and help you too as well. Um, so welcome along to the program, Todd and Marsha. Delighted to be with you, Justin. Thanks for having yes, me. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be on your program. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to you both in the course of this and, and hearing the debate as well. I'm sure um, there'll be things you agree on, but plenty to disagree on as well. Uh, Todd, tell us a bit about yourself, first of all, um, the Centre for Pastor Theologians and what got you into writing a book specifically on this subject? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so a little bit about me. I am a pastor by background, spent 15 years pastoring a couple of different churches in the Chicagoland area. Also an academic by background um, and uh, love the life of the mind and learning and research and writing. I have a, a, a research PhD, uh, so I sometimes describe myself as an academic trapped in a pastor's body. <laughs> Uh, and I lead this organization now full time the last couple of years called the Center for Pastor Theologians, which is a way of bringing these two passions together of academics and pastoral ministry and leadership, uh, helping pastors all around the, the United States be effective thought leaders for their congregations. So uh, that's me kind of vocationally and professionally, uh, the father of seven children, uh, wow. married my high school sweetheart came to faith through her family. Her father led me to Christ in the corner booth of a McDonald's about 30 years ago. So I have a dramatic sort of conversion story, perhaps like Marsha's. I don't know, your, Marsha, your full story, but that's my background. And what got me into writing a book on the Enneagram, Justin, is being the father of seven children. I'm like the mayor of a small town. And uh, <laughs> so uh, as soon as I learned about the Enneagram, I started applying it to our very complex and exciting family. And it started opening up all sorts of insights and then applying it to our marriage and then taking it to uh, the congregation I was leading at the time and finding it was just tremendously helpful in understanding uh, human dynamics and human relationships. And I thought I should write a book. I know how to write books. I'm pretty good at writing books. So let me write a book on this, what has been a very helpful tool and apply it to the life of the church. Wow, very, very interesting. Thank you for, for the introduction to yourself, Todd. Uh, before we come to sort of understand what the Enneagram is, let's let's hear your background as well, Marsha. Um, tell us about this story of yours. You know, you were an astrologer for a number of years. What, what led you out of that eventually? Tell us some of your background. Well, I was in what is called the New Age for a good 20 years. And I was not an astrologer that whole time. I became astrologer towards the latter part, the last half of those 20 years. Um, And I was a professional certified astrologer. I had to take a seven-hour exam, Um, practiced in Atlanta, Georgia. I was president of the Astrological Society and chairperson of the Board of Astrology Examiners, which formulated and graded the exam that you had to take and pass to get certified by buying a business license. That's kind of a quick summary. (laughs) But yeah, I was very involved also with um, Eastern religions, particularly um, Zen Buddhism. I started off in Tibetan Buddhism 
and then went into Zen Buddhism for another year, uh, uh, another number of years doing uh, the Buddhist meditation every day. Um, I had tarot cards. You know, I took a course in numerology and I sort of went into different areas, which is very typical of the new age. You usually don't stay just in one area. But astrology was my focus. I was extremely involved with this new age worldview um, and partly a Buddhist Hindu worldview. And God intervened in my life. It's it's kind of a story, so I, I, I'm not going to really give it here because it would take a little too long. Um, and it was something that happened um, over a series of months with uh, interventions from the Lord that were really, there's no explanation except that it was from God. And that led me to um, give astrology up, actually, before I was a Christian. And then I started reading the Bible and it was while I was reading uh, Matthew chapter 8 that God opened my eyes to who Christ really was. So I'd had the New Age Jesus and the New Age God, and I realized who Jesus really was. And at that moment, I realized I had been wrong my whole life, and I turned my life over to Christ, and I knew immediately I was, I was new, a new person. I knew that. I didn't understand, and I didn't have the language for any of this. <laughs> um, and, and after that, it was a very um, interesting journey because I didn't have anyone around me to help me with Christianity mm. because of the church I was going to at the time. So, um, But the Lord got me through all of that. And eventually um, that led me to a ministry, Christian Answers for the New Age. And I've been doing that full time for 23 years. I operate as a missionary I'm with uh, Fellowship International Mission, which is my mission agency in Pennsylvania. But I live in Northern Virginia. Um, I'm supported by um, several churches and individuals. So I live on support. And I've been doing this full time. I started out doing it part time before that. And I deal with the new age and the occult. It's it's a wonderful, amazing story. Uh, I can see Todd, you know, uh, <laughs> really encouraged by that as well. Amazing. Um, obviously, though, you've come to different perspectives and conclusions on this particular yes. issue. Um, and we don't have time to examine all of the, the aspects of, of Eastern Orient and Orientalism and, and all of the sort of new age practices. But <laughs> but let's start with um, what the Enneagram is, um, Todd. Maybe you can kick us off on this. What What is the Enneagram and how have you seen it applied fruitfully in family situations yeah. and indeed in the church? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you, Justin, at the outset, you in your introduction, I think you captured it you know, succinctly and well, the Enneagram is a personality typing system uh, with nine different personality types. And there are layers for kind of how to think about that, the theory of personality that's embedded in the Enneagram system. But that's the gist of it. Nine different personality types organized around thinking, feeling, and doing how it is that you put together those three dimensions of human experience and, and life uh, and the different way you put those together shapes your personality. Uh, so that's the gist of the Enneagram. A simpler way to think about it is it's nine different ways of seeing the world or nine different ways of, of navigating the world. Um, and, and you know, may, maybe a little disclaimer, um, I am more passionate about understanding people and personality than I am about the Enneagram, right? I mean, I've written a book on the Enneagram because I think the Enneagram is a marvelous window in on the important thing, which is not the Enneagram. You could take or leave the Enneagram as far as I'm concerned. I just think it's the most helpful way, at least that's accessible for normal people on this thing that we all know about called personality. And why, how has it been helpful? It's unbelievably helpful to understand people. You have to understand people. I mean, I, I had a lot of education, a lot of experience going into pastoral leadership. And I had a master's degree and a Ph.D. and published journal articles and New Testament scholarship and all the rest of it and good mentors and good church experiences. But I was kind of an amateur in understanding people, really. I knew a lot about Greek and Hebrew exegesis, but I didn't know much about what it meant to be a human being, really. I mean, I could talk about it theologically, but that's very different than understanding the nuances and, and specifics of real people in a congregation that you need to lead. So what makes for good leadership, good pastoral leadership or good leadership anywhere in the world, in any kind of an organization or firm or whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing, 
What makes for good leadership is self-understanding, self-awareness, and others' awareness. If you don't have self-awareness and you don't have others' awareness, you are not going to be an effective leader. And any secular leadership guru would tell you that, much less Christian pastors. Um, so the Enneagram is just a marvelously helpful, I'd even say efficient way of getting at this thing we all know about called personality and, and unpacking it in a really accessible and yet profound kind of way. That's that's why I've become a big fan of the Enneagram. OK. And and just briefly, could you say what these nine types are? You won't be able to go into any detail, really. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, yeah. What, what, just give us some examples. Yeah. So the Enneagram is organized around nine numbers, right? To keep it kind of straightforward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the number one is the perfectionist. It's kind of suggest uh, it's probably self-evident what that kind of personality type is. Number two, the helper. Number three, the achiever. Number four, the, the romantic is what it's often called, a, the kind of the poet, the deep feeler, the intuitive type. Number five the, the, um, uh, is, is the um, kind of research personality type, the observer, sometimes called the investigator. Number six, the loyalist. This is the social glue, often in organizations or churches. Number seven, the adventurer. This is the playful, fun, creative type. Number eight, the challenger. This tends to be the fairly aggressive, sometimes dominant, domineering personality type. And number nine, lastly, the peacemaker. Uh, this is the serene, calm, sometimes detached personality type. So those are the nine personality types. Okay. And let me just say one other thing, Justin, about yeah. the Enneagram that has made me such a fan about it is I, I don't know anybody who has spent um, meaningful time with the Enneagram and come away thinking, well, that's stupid. <laughs> because when you, it's like a hypothesis. If you take it up and try it out for a while, it, it gives you, it's amazing the way it gives you insight into yourself and other personalities in a way that just opens up things. I mean, I've known many people over the last number of years in, in, in talking about and working with the Enneagram who start getting into the Enneagram and they have the wow <laughs> with, with the Enneagram. Like, that's unbelievable. How did it sure. know this about me? Or how did it know this about my spouse yeah. or my, you know? And I've had so many people, Justin, last thing I'll say is cry. Wow. They break down in tears because they're like, I'm not like alone in the way I work in the world. I thought it was just me that approached the world this way. And now I understand there's like a whole framework for making sense of how I am in the okay. world. It, well, Todd, obviously a fan of the Enneagram. Uh, <laughs> yes. he, he wrote a whole book on it. Um, OK, Marsha, before we get into your concerns with the Enneagram, maybe just Give us a little bit of a flavor of, in your view, where it all came from to begin with. What's the history of the Enneagram? Yes, um, and that might lead us then into some of your, your concerns. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd like to start off by saying both of you have given an incorrect definition of the Enneagram. The Enneagram is not a personality test. It is actually a way to discover the true self or the true essence. That was how it was designed, and that was how it was used in the New Age. Um, I remember the Enneagram from the New Age. Um, I didn't use it, but it, but I remember, you know, hearing about it and people using it. It is actually the nine types are actually stand for false constructs. Uh, they are, they are the conditioned you. Um, in other words, this is how you think you are. This is what you think you are based on your experiences based on what people have told you, based on your beliefs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you've accumulated this identity, this false identity, and you're supposed to work through that once you discover, okay, my false identity is a, let's say is a three. So once you discover that, I'm not saying that's what I am because I, I haven't, I'm, I don't identify with it, <laughs> but I'm just hypothetically, then you're supposed to figure out okay, this is what caused all that. This is the fears I had. This is how I was conditioned to believe. Um, and then you see the true self. And that is when you begin your transformation. This is actually in a book by Don Riso and Russ Hudson, who are both New Agers who founded the co-founded the Enneagram Institute, which is a completely 100% New Age organization. 
And it's the book that uh, I think in Todd's in Todd's book, he said his sister-in-law was reading a book by John Riso and Hudson. And it was that book. And it's in that book that actually says these are false constructs. So the purpose is not to know your personality. And like Chris Horitz says, who uh, wrote the Sacred Enneagram, a supposedly Christian book, um, he says, you are not a type, you have a type but that type is in the way of who you really are. So I want to make that clear that people are misunderstanding what it actually is. It also is not based on any uh, credible psychological theory. It didn't come from studies, research, psychological organizations. It, it has none of that at all. It has no credibility in the world of psychology. You you think it's essentially pseudo scientific? Yeah, that I sense, think it's then, pseudo scientific Marcia. with occult origins and undertones. That um, because the enneagram doesn't isn't based on any objective data, it's very malleable. And actually, the other point I want to address before I, I if you you know if you then want me to talk a little bit about the origins is when people think that it really works, like Todd said, it was. It was wonderful. And he saw people who would say, wow, you know, how did it know that about me? Or, you know, get these strong reactions. You get the exact same reactions with astrology. I was an astrologer. I did astrological birth charts. And I can tell you every single one of my clients were astounded at what I knew about them just by looking at their birth chart. Now, I think that what's happening here, it's not because astrology is valid, but there's a lot of factors that go into this. Um, psychologists tell us that the reason something like a, a regular personality test seems to peg us, or the reason we think it's it's like, oh yeah, that's right, that's who I am, is several factors like the um, Forer effect or the Barnum effect. Um, there's confirmation bias. There's subjective validation. There's self-deception. We tend to want to identify with something and we tend to want to see a pattern. And so people can believe that they are a four on the Enneagram as strongly as someone can believe they're an Aries with uh, Pisces rising and the moon in Gemini. And so it's a psychological trick, self-deception that causes us to identify with these things because there's no validity in it at all. OK, well, I'm going to come back to you in a okay. moment, Marsha, because okay. I know you've written this book, particularly in the way you think that some characters, including the one you mentioned in the title, Richard Raw, uh, are particularly, you know, bring, bringing this into the church, into the mainstream and so on. Um, but first of all, just some responses, Todd, to, to all of this. I mean, Marsha says it's not a personality, you know, categorization tool. It's actually got this idea of spirit spiritual self-discovery and finding your true essence and everything yeah. and it's it's plainly kind of in that mold of the new age kind of you know um ideas uh and and this you know is immediately going to send warning signals up for many christians yes. who say no <laughs> yes to, my, me you know, me included <laughs> yeah so 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 yeah well, I'm, i don't want to do mean... anything super new agey <laughs> <laughs> i mean so, okay what why, I, I think why do you essence, disagree I think, then here I, what well, I think the, uh, this may get to the very essence of the issue, which is derivation and direction of something. Um, the, I, I have no objection, and, and Marcia knows the literature and the history way better than I do, and I, I have no stake in the question of where the Enneagram came from, how many New Age people used it, how New Agey it was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of that I'm happy to grant. But I don't think that undermines it as a tool that can be used by Christians as long as it's Christianly utilized and appropriated. So I don't believe in the genetic fallacy, what is sometimes called the genetic fallacy, which is a way of saying where something comes from dictates and determines what it is. That is, I think, the premise of Marsh's position, which is it comes from dubious. Well, let me just finish. It comes from dubious or it's got dubious origins. It's got all these new age associations. It's got, it's not really about personality typing. It's about essences, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and I'm happy to say, yeah, that's probably right. I mean, that may well be right. But that doesn't mean it can't be transposed and appropriated in a Christianly responsible way. Where something comes from doesn't dictate 
where it goes or even what it is actually in my view it would be like saying yoga can a christian go to a yoga class well i'm sure marsha or someone else could say yoga has all these new age eastern influences it's got all this bad stuff oh my gosh and they talk about all this crazy stuff when you go to yoga about you know getting merging with the earth etc cetera, etc cetera. all of which may be true but that doesn't mean a christian can't go to yoga and walk away 60 minutes later and say wow that was a good exercise and I still love Jesus and all that weird stuff about new age they were smuggling into the class. Yeah, I'm not into it, but I, I did a bunch of stretches and downward dogs and, and I feel great. <laughs> and, and I just think this is what mature, responsible Christian living in our world is really all about. It's about a hermeneutic that can appropriate things that have non-Christian origins in a Christianly responsible way. Okay. Your response, yes, Marcia. I want to say I am not using the genetic fallacy. I'm very aware. Something I learned in seminary was my seminary was very apologetics oriented. So we were taken through all the ideas of fallacies and I had to take a course in logic. Um, and it is not the genetic fallacy because the genetic fallacy only applies if you are basing your whole argument just on the fact of the origins or if the origins don't matter. But sometimes the origins do matter. You know, I if I said this is a, a glass of medicine for your stomach flu, and, and it was really just a glass of Kool-Aid, well, the origin would matter. If I got, if I gave, if it was from medicine or from Kool-Aid, it would matter. So the origin does matter in this case because you're looking at a person to understand them supposedly. Therefore, there's got to, it's got to be based on something, right? It's got to be based on objective data about personality theory or about different kinds of people and how that is all set up in some kind of chart. But that's not the way this came about. And, and actually, psychologists don't accept the Enneagram. I've had many Christian psychologists tell me this is, this is pseudoscience and it's not used in the professional field of psychology. We have um, Dr. Jay Medenwalt is a Christian psychologist who has looked at the Enneagram and looked at some of the claims, the testing for it, which was all done by New Agers and never published in peer reviewed journals. It basically fails this psych psychometric test, which is how you test personality tests. So it fails that test. Um, so here's there's two issues here. One is, is the genetic fallacy apply? And the other is, does a genetic fallacy matter if what you're dealing with is invalid to begin with? If it's invalid to begin with, then there is no reason for a Christian to use it. It's kind of like saying, is astrology valid? If astrology is not valid, I mean, Todd, you said you, you could take something with non-Christian origins and use it. Do you really think that you could use astrology for, for personality understanding? Because I, I just told you how accurate people thought it was. Well, I mean, the question, the question is not, uh, the question is one can take something that's got non-Christian origins and appropriate it. It's not that you should do that with everything that's non-Christian. Some non-Christian things are dopey and have no value. <laughs> and I would put astrology in that bucket, but evolutionary biology, yoga, psychology, economics. I mean, I went to a Wheaton, I went to Wheaton College, a Christian liberal arts college. We studied every discipline from a Christian perspective. The vast majority of the things we studied come from non-Christians and have like, you know, Charles Darwin, you know, he, I don't know, he kind of lost his faith. Evolution has been really bad, but can Christians appropriate that as a way of thinking about the origins of organic life? I hope, I think so. I think so. Can they do it in a way that undermines their faith? Yes, that would be a problem. But Putting it in a God-centered perspective, yeah, for sure. Only, only. But that may be a fundamental, let me just say here, Justin, that may be a fundamental difference is it would be interesting to know, Marsha, like what you do with, let's say, evolutionary biology, for example, like whether that's something that a Christian can take into a God-centered worldview or not, or is that, a, would okay. that be hot, like hostile to the Christian faith? Here's my answer. I Because I think it hermeneutically is the same issue. My answer would be, it has to be based on valid scientific data. So, um, and I'm not going to 
discuss evolution, but anything that a Christian can appropriate needs to be based on objective truth. You know, it needs to be based on objective truth. The Enneagram is not, just like astrology. So the Enneagram is as valid as astrology. They both fall in the same category. And in fact, Jay Medenwald in his article um, on the Enneagram in part two of it, when he writes about why people believe the Enneagram is accurate, he says it works the same way as astrology. So there's no validity. It's not like it's some kind of time-tested tool that that has been used on the secular world in a val and recognized as a valid tool. It's never been recognized as a valid tool. Let's come back to that in a moment. Okay. Uh, Marsha okay. Montenegro and Todd Wilson <laughs> Are joining me on today's show we're asking should christians embrace the enneagram we've already got a feisty debate on our hands which we like here and, unbelievable. Uh, and and we'll be back in a moment's time to uh, to continue the discussion uh do do uh, do keep with us uh, it's going to be an interesting one as we look at the enneagram from both sides today for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter Welcome back to today's show. Really interesting discussion on the Enneagram today. Should Christians embrace it? It's an interesting system, personality type, though. We're debating whether it is that as well uh, on the show today. Many people have been talking about the Enneagram in the last several years, but Christians are split over its effectiveness and whether it's dodgy, basically. Um, is it some kind of spiritual new age kind of Trojan horse into the church. Uh, Todd Wilson and Marsha Montenegro join me on the show today. Todd Wilson is the author of The Enneagram Goes to Church. He's in favour of the Enneagram on the show today. Marsha is the author of Richard Raw and The Enneagram Secret. She's very critical of the Enneagram as someone who was in the New Age movement. Um, and we'll come back to you, Marsha, for the sort of Richard Raw connection in a minute. But um, Todd, first of all, um, so quite a number of criticisms from Marsha, um, particularly, obviously, that whole occult sort of uh, origins thing. I mean, I've got to confess, even I, you know, not knowing much about the Enneagram, it kind of sounds kind of a bit weird, um, a <laughs> yeah. bit like the word pentagram. It's got yes. a similar kind of look yep. to the shape that you typically gets associated with it, these yeah. nine, nine pointed symbol. Um, so, so it's kind of natural, even for someone who hasn't done the research Marsha has for someone to be a bit like, Ooh, I'm not too sure about this, this whole thing. Um, yes. So we should tread carefully, right? I mean, there's no harm. Absolutely. In, you know, so, 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 but what convinces you that the benefits outweigh the potential concerns here? Presumably you've seen some really transformative effects when you have used it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let me just affirm Justin and Marsha uh, that, that I agree entirely that if we if Christians in an irresponsible way grab hold of the local Enneagram New Age teachers version of the Enneagram and just, you know, take it hook, line and sinker, that can be quite deleterious to their faith and unhelpful. You can smuggle in, per your point, Trojan horse ways of thinking about human nature and the divine and a thousand other things. Um, so I'm not at all a fan of that. I'm also not trying to say the new age drenched version of the Enneagram is fine for Christians to use. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, just like I wouldn't say Christians can go to a yoga studio and do a bunch of new agey yoga and, and think it's great too. I mean, that's, uh, you could appropriate yoga for good exercise, but you would want to do that in a responsible way. So I just want to, fully affirm uh, the, the anxiety about the Enneagram and the hesitation about the Enneagram. My only thing is, I think we all would agree, personality is a real thing. There is such a thing as personality. I think there, there's no reason to question that. That's a little different than astrology, right? That the movement of planets has some direct correlation. And, and Marsha, I see you shaking your head. Perhaps I don't understand astrology, so I'm happy for you to correct me on this. But my point is, I, my point is, it is widespread, universally agreed that personality is a real thing, right? That's not like some debatable new age idea. Then the question is, like, how can we get access to that and the differences in personality? We can use lots of things. There are lots of the big five and, you know, things that have, to Marcia's point earlier, 
a little more validity and reliability. They've 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 stood up under scientific testing and rigor. That's great. And and use the big five. Use that kind of stuff. Use Myers Briggs. Although there's some question about is that is scientifically valid. That's all fine. For me, the Enneagram doesn't have, at least it doesn't yet have, the kind of validity and reliability scrutiny and testing. It may. I do know some pretty well-regarded psychologists and psychiatrists that are using it. For example, Dan Siegel, the kind of nationally famous, at least in America, Harvard-trained UCLA psychologist written any number of books, who is currently working on a book on the Enneagram and has been a big fan of it, or David Daniels, who taught at Stanford for any number of years, who's a huge fan of the Enneagram, and said, in my 50-year clinical practice, nothing has even gotten half as helpful and powerful as the Enneagram. So these are highly regarded psychologists, psychiatrists who have appropriated the Enneagram, though it, it, it is true. It doesn't have the same sort of scientific rigor. But here's what I say in the book, Justin. I say, I don't try to make the argument that the Enneagram is has validity and reliability. Therefore, because it's got scientific bona fides, Christians should use it. I sidestep that and say the Enneagram is a wisdom tradition. It's a stockpile of wise insights into what it, into how human beings work. And just like the book of Proverbs doesn't have scientific reliability and validity, and yet it's still incredibly helpful for living. So too, the Enneagram as a wisdom tradition is just that. And like I said earlier, I don't know really anybody who has worn the Enneagram as it were, taken it on as a hypothesis and worked with it for a month or two and really kind of explored it, who hasn't come away thinking to themselves, that is incredibly insightful to human behavior. I think in a way then, Marsha, it's a sort of, all truth is God's truth. And yes, we don't have to accept everything from its origins and the way other people use it, but it works and it's insightful and therefore, you know, appropriated correctly and in a biblical way. Um, uh, it, it, it is a tool that God has given us in a sense. Yeah, but here, um, here's the problem. To be Todd's um, argument. The, the pro if I could, if I could go ahead and respond, because there's several things I want to respond to. Sure. Um, first of all, it's not truth. That's that's the problem. It's not based on any truth. The types came through automatic writing, which is a form of spirit contact. That's where the nine types came from, and they didn't appear until around 1970, 1971, through Claudio Naranjo. So when Todd says a wisdom tradition, there's no basis for calling it a wisdom tradition. It's been the types have existed for 50 years, and they came from spirit contact. Uh, they they were developed in the new age. They weren't developed any, under any rigorous testing. The two psychologists he mentioned, Dan Siegel and David Daniels, were into the are into the new age. Well, da David Daniels is dead. He worked for years and years with Helen Palmer, who was the psychic who brought the enneagram into the new age. She no longer calls herself a psychic. She's sort of reinvented herself, like a lot of new agers into this kind of counseling guru. Um, and But she is 100% new age. And this is who David Daniels worked with. Um, and I read so, a little bit of his, what he's written and it's, it's very new age oriented. Now, was he a complete new ager? I don't know, but he was definitely open to the new age. He was also a psychiatrist. And I've been told uh, that psychiatrists really aren't that up on personality tests and things like that. That's not their area of expertise. Um, and I also want to mention uh, the fact that about personality, the reason that no personality tests are really considered valid in psychology is because it's, a, it's this very ephemeral thing and it's very shifting and changing. So they say, for example, you can take the Myers-Briggs and then five years from now, when you take it, you could come out in a completely different categories. Uh, so you're, you change over time because personality is not necessarily a fixed thing. Uh, and also, and it's, of course, it's going to depend on how you define it. But generally speaking, we don't, in, as Christians, we don't want to see ourselves in terms of personality. We want to see ourselves in terms of character. And we want to see that what's happening with us God's word tells us we're being uh, conformed to the image of Christ. So Christ is our model. And, and the way we grow in Christ through the Holy Spirit, uh, which is through reading God's word, through worship, through fellowship with other believers, 
that way we get conformed. God shapes us and molds us how he wants to use us and how he wants us to reflect Christ. And that is the purpose. We're not going to get there with personality because personality is very self-focused. It's not and nothing, nothing about our personality is going to prevent God from how he wants to shape us. So I don't, I don't think having to know our personality is important. But in astrology, I do want to say that is one of the main features of it, is this is who you are. This is um, how your relationships, how you are in relationships. This is how the, your childhood influenced you. This is uh, how, where you would be best in your job or career. And people base that on their astrological reading. I very much fit quote unquote, fit my birth chart. I fit it to such a T that I could explain to people, oh yeah, well I did that because my sun and moon are in this sign, or I, that's the way I am in relationships because my Venus is in, you know, the eighth house or whatever. And I t also carried this information to other people and they all said, yes, that, that helps me understand myself. And I can guarantee you if I could somehow get Todd and people that he knew uh, to to get an astrological reading, maybe without knowing it was an astrological reading, because <laughs> I know he would never agree to it. And I am definitely, Todd, not saying that you would in any way endorse astrology. I'm just making a point here. If I could get you or any other Christian to get your chart done and the information to you through the chart, you would be astounded at how accurate it was because it's okay. the same psychological factors at work in the Enneagram as astrology. Well, I, I, you know, I, it's interesting. I mean, I think, Marsha, what I hear you saying is you're, you're a bit skeptical of the notion of personality just it, it, in as general. As an important thing, as something we, sh we should know about, yeah. Well, so that's, but that's a more theological question per and perhaps, a philosophical yeah. question about how, Christi how Christians, given our Christian theological commitments, think about what psychologists and social scientists call personality or psychologists in right. particular. But, Justin, this is a this is going to be just a gigantic game changer. If she doesn't credence the reality of personality, then you know this is going to be a hard conversation. I mean, we will be miles and miles and miles apart because if I I, I credence personality, I think it's a, a, a nearly universally affirmed notion and concept within the psychological disciplines. And, um, and and there are valid and reliable ways of getting after it. The big five personality test, your listeners can Google it and Wikipedia it. I mean, that has withstood scientific rigor. I think that's widely agreed upon as having, you know, the five personality traits as, as being scientifically reliable and valid. This thing called personality. And again, my thing is, the, I don't care about the Enneagram. I care about personality. I care about who we are as people and how we work. The Enneagram just is a good window in on that. If Myers-Briggs was really powerful and effective and didn't compromise your faith in crazy ways, I'd be like, yeah, Myers-Briggs could be really helpful too. I, uh, so, I, but, but if Marsha doesn't credence the idea of personality, that, we're going to be a thousand miles apart. And I guess that would be maybe just the start. Well, what I'm saying is I don't think it's, it's so important that we have to have a diagram to try to figure out what our, our personality is. And I also want to say the Enneagram is not based on the big five. And I heard a video, uh, a video sure. lecture by uh, Jordan Peterson talking about the big five. And he said, this is the closest thing that psychology has to talking about personality. And, and, and in other words, any other personality test out there is probably not going to be valid. And so he offers a, a test. He actually came up with a test based on the big five he came up with himself and that, but see, but Claudio Naranjo didn't base this on the big five. He was using the teachings of, of Ichazo about finding the true self. And then he gets the types via spirit contact. So he, he and Ichazo both did a lot of spirit contact. I mean, they were occultists and new agers. That's where the Enneagram comes from. I mean, are, are you aware of this? Are you, have you been aware of these origins that, that Marsh is claiming about these types being oh, sure. discovered through yeah. automatic writing? Oh, yeah, writing? Oh, sure, of I mean, course. Yeah, doesn't I'm that sure, sure. raise some major red flags, Todd, for No, you? not major red know. flags, not major red flags, just like just like I believe in evolutionary biology as, 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 as the reigning paradigm that explains the origins of biological life. Marsha may disagree with that. 
But I think it's a nearly universal scientific consensus that this is how biological life has come about. And, and by the way, coronavirus vaccines depend upon that theory. So I, like, I, but where did it come from? Charles Darwin, what has been the impact of evolutionary biology on Christian faith? It's been devastating in so many ways. Nevertheless, it's true, I think, or it's the best case for what is true about biological life. So at this point, it's like you got to appropriate that as a Christian and make sense of it theologically. That's that's my basic disposition towards these things. Um, and I think that's probably what underlies our difference of opinion, where I think s some Christians have a um, are more sensitive to the origin of ideas or the associations or connections that certain ideas have with other things. So, for example, saying the Enneagram isn't, you know, comes from New Age people or David Daniels is a New Ager or, you know, like to me, I hear that and I say, yeah, that's I'm not a New Ager and that's too bad. David Daniels is a New Ager. I don't think people should be New Agers. I think they should be Jesus lovers. <laughs> but that doesn't scuttle the Enneagram, just like it doesn't scuttle evolutionary biology or yoga is a good form of exercise or Adam Smith's theory of <laughs> supply and demand. I mean, all of it can be appropriated. As, I mean, as is, a, is a there Christian. a danger, Todd, as well, that, you know, I, I have almost heard of people being almost religiously, you know, devoted yeah. to the Enneagram, yes. Christians as well. Um, yes. it, in as much as one of the concerns I've heard about it is it kind of becomes your new paradigm for understanding yes. the world and everything. That's right. And for Christians, no, that should be Christ and his spirit in yes. us that that is our you know lens through which we rather than this specific system and and I th is there a danger there that people kind of essentially replace jesus yes. and christianity with the enneagram this is the thing that transforms my life rather than christ through the holy spirit what what, yeah, what no, do you say to that yeah no for sure there's a danger i mean whenever you have anything that's very powerful and has high explanatory power it's tempting to give it a lot of credence and lean into it heavily. Um, and certainly the Enneagram is that. It is has a massive amount of explanatory power. I mean, why has it become so popular? It's become so popular because it's got such explanatory power, uh, I think. Um, and, I, and I don't think, with due respect to what Marcia said, I don't think it's because we're all self-deluded. <laughs> I think it's because it's latching on to objective reality about the way people's brains work. Um, and their personalities. Um, but, but Justin, I, d I do very much think Christians can misuse it. It can, it can be distracting. It can be um, uh, um, theologically befuddling for Christians, for sure. So in my book, in the first chapter called All Truth is God's Truth, I, I say, hey, listen, I started off very skeptical about the Enneagram. I have lots of reasons to not think the Enneagram is a good thing. I mean, I come from a very sort of reformed Calvinistic theological background in that world, the Enneagram's not cool, you poo poo it. I mean, I, I, I totally get all of that. Um, and, and, and I say Christians need to take this very seriously and not just sort of appropriate it without thinking it through okay. theologically. Yeah. Um, let, let's come back to you, Marsha. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot you'll probably want to respond to that. I do want to ask about the Richard Raw thing, because that's okay. right in the title of the book you wrote on yeah. this. So so what, what, what's he got to do with the Enneagram? And maybe just a quick description of who he is for those who don't, don't I know. I do want him. to mention I have two co-authors on this book, uh, Don and Joy Vino, sure. V-E-I-N-O-T. So I, their names haven't been given yet. And since we all three wrote the book, I don't want to leave them out. Um, so yes, Richard Rohr um, learned the Enneagram uh, when it was taken to a, uh, apparently to Loyola in Chicago by a Jesuit named Bob Oakes, who learned it from Claudio Naranjo. Uh, and it was taught there. Richard Rohr and some others learned it, um, including a priest named Mitch Pacwa. Uh, and Richard Rohr glommed onto it. He, he took it to heart and liked it. Uh, I just mentioned Mitch Pacwa because Mitch Pacwa later who he taught the Enneagram and used it, when he discovered that it was really invalid and he discovered where it came from, that it didn't really have any psychologically valid um, origins or basis, he started exposing it and he wrote a book called Catholics and the New Age in, 19, I think, 1994, exposing it. Um, Richard Rohr, meanwhile, wrote a book with Andreas Ebert on the Enneagram that later became the Enneagram, a Christian perspective. 
And for a long time, that book was just kind of out there and it wasn't in, it certainly wasn't in the evangelical church. But after um, 2000, after maybe 2005, because of Richard's War influence on the progressives like Rob Bell and Brian McLaren, um, it got into the progressive camp. And they started introducing the Enneagram at their workshops. Now, this was when I noticed it getting, for me, too close to comfort to the, to the church. And my first article on the Enneagram was written in 2011. And that's on my website. It's called the Enneagram GPS Gnostic Path to the Self, because that's what the Enneagram is for. It was designed to find the true self, and it's very Gnostic in, the, in its uh, worldview. Uh, so there it was in the progressive church, and it was there for several years until it got into the evangelical church through The Road Back to You by Suzanne Stabile and Ian Cron, both of whom are disciples of Richard Rohr. Suzanne Stabile and her husband were mentored for several years by Richard Rohr, and Ian Cron basically is like a colleague of Richard Rohr, teaches at Richard Rohr's uh, center there in Albuquerque. And the reason this is a problem is that Richard Rohr is completely heretical in his beliefs. He uh, pretty much doesn't hold to any of the essentials of the Christian faith. He believes the first, I'm gonna tick them off real quickly. He believes the first incarnation of Christ was creation. He believes that sin is not an issue because we're all part of creation, therefore we're all already in Christ. So nobody needs salvation. All we need is awareness. We need awareness that we've never been separated from God. He also makes a distinction between Jesus and the universal Christ. So at the resurrection, Jesus went away and the universal Christ went into creation and is a power that is drawing all creation towards a point of perfection. Um, he, I think he was very influenced by Teilhard de Chardin, who taught the cosmic Christ and taught about a cosmic Christ as his power in creation. And so apparently uh, Richard Rohr based a lot of his ideas on that. So as you can see, this is, a, you know, and also he doesn't believe Jesus is coming again. So he denies almost all the essentials of the faith. And it's his disciples, including Chris Horitz, who wrote the Sacred Enneagram, whom he also mentored, um, who got the Enneagram into the church. After those two books were published, one by IVP and one by Zondervan, it gave the Enneagram credibility. Those books also pass on falsehoods from Richard Rohr, such as the Enneagram has ancient origins or started with fourth century monk Evagrius Ponticus. This has all been debunked. It's not true. Um, and and I know, sometimes people say the origins are murky or we don't know the origins. We know the origins. I can give them to you in well, three minutes. Um, but it's there, it started that, in the 20th it's, century. But, but it's, it's a helpful over... Well, let, let's... Let's say it's a helpful overview as to how you see Richard Raw's influence yeah, in this area. Yeah. Now, he does have just an for influence. the record, Richard Raw isn't here to, def to isn't here to defend himself uh, <laughs> when it comes to the to, to the things oh, that you say. Oh, he would agree with me. He would agree with this. Um, well, <laughs> I, and I just want to say, if Richard Raw ever wants to come on the show, he's very welcome <laughs> to and and, and I have a chat with you, joke. Marcia. <laughs> but the point being, uh, I'm not here. We're not here to to debate the you know the, whether Richard Raw is orthodox or not. But but it's it. I, I understand your point that, that for he for you he's been a significant person who is sort of from you know obviously ha having begun with the Catholic Church he's had increasing influence in progressive and evangelical circles um, in recent years and obviously you think that that's been a lot of where the Enneagram sort of interest has come from. Um, Todd, any I, I don't know whether the, any of this you know has any interest for you as to, to this aspect of the whole I, I, thing. Well, yeah, it, it does. I mean, I just I I it's everything I think Marcia said sounds about right to me. I mean, she knows this, the story origins and, and Richard Orr a lot better than I do, but I think everything she says strikes me as, as right and, and fairly accurate. The things I've heard about Richard Orr's theology, and I appreciate your point about this isn't, you know, a time to assess Richard Rohr in, in that sense, but uh, that all, that all sounds, sounds about right to me. But I think, again, it gets back to, I'm going to bring it up again, the genetic fallacy, or maybe even the association fallacy, like Richard Rohr likes Enneagram. Richard Rohr is heretic. Therefore, Enneagram is suspect. That kind of an argument, I just don't buy at all. That's not my argument. No, I, okay, I feel like argument, I, my argument's but... being missed. 
I feel like it's being misunderstood. That's not my argument. I'm not giving the genetic I, fallacy or the association fallacy. I'm saying the Enneagram has no validity just even in secular psychology. But in addition to that, it is a spiritual tool. It was formed as a spiritual tool, and it's seen as a spiritual tool. It's not a neutral psychological. If it were a neutral psychological tool, I could agree with a lot of what Todd says. If it was a neutral psychological tool and had been used in psychology and validated as, as at least somewhat helpful or accurate, and then should Christians use it, then there there might be issues around, you know, other issues. Before we go to our final break, just a quick chance to respond there, Todd, because ultimately, Please. firstly, I think you disagree basically on, on the question of whether it is actually psychologically valid. But but I'm guessing also, you, you, to some extent, I don't I don't, I don't disagree on that, Justin. It. I don't I don't think I disagree. I think I, 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 I don't I it's I think it's clear that it doesn't have scientific validity and reliability at this point. There aren't a bunch of studies published in, in leading scientific journals that demonstrate its validity and reliability, and it may never come. My only point is it doesn't matter because there are millions of things in the world that are helpful for doing life that don't have scientific validity and reliability, <laughs> right? I mean, I, and if you claim the Enneagram does, you would be wrong on that point. I don't claim the Enneagram is scientifically I mean reliable and valid. valid. Give us your quick elevator pitch then about the way the Enneagram has changed your life, because that's often what ultimately people are going on is the way they've seen it happen. You know, happen I mean, in their I could get, lives. yeah, no, for sure. I mean, a, a, a lots of things. The main thing, Justin, is self awareness, not as a counter to Christian virtues and character development and the leading of the Spirit and meditation on Scripture, but as a concrete way to think about that. What is like, we all say, well, I struggle with pride. Oh, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's true. And it's theologically valid and biblically tr accurate, but the Enneagram will then all of a sudden give you ways to think about concretely in your unique personality, how pride works itself out. So it's been incredibly helpful in getting concrete, taking theological truths and giving a window in on how it works out concretely in my particular makeup as a human being. And then others awareness it, it's it's been so helpful in raising my compassion empathy and understanding of other people and generosity and and i think wisdom in working with other people and and not assuming everybody's brain works like my brain because that's not true actually and so it's been it's just been a huge help in in that regard as well we're, we're going to go to a final break and then we'll we'll hear more responses from marcia and uh, counter responses from todd we're talking about the enneagram today should christians embrace it we're asking we'll be back very shortly in the united kingdom just today we passed a hundred thousand people who've been killed by the virus. I'm not the one here who is claiming that this is being supervised, that somebody is watching this, somebody knows that this is occurring, and somebody's allowing it to occur. We're in no position to say definitively there is no morally justifiable reason for this particular evil, because we need a godlike perspective on all of space and all of time in order to make that claim. So we've been asking, should Christians embrace the Enneagram today? Um, I didn't know an awful lot about the Enneagram before I picked up uh, the book by Todd Wilson, The Enneagram Goes to Church, and indeed the counter response, if you like, by Marcia Montenegro, which is Richard Raw and The Enneagram Secret. Um, links to both of them from today's show. But if you want to go straight there, toddawilson.com for Todd's website, christiananswersforthenewage.org for more on Marcia. OK, Marcia, time time to respond. Obviously, T Todd laying out the way that he has seen it have a transformative effect in his own life, the way he understands people. And that's not to, that's not in competition, he says, with the way he understands things as a Christian and, and so on. It's it's a tool that God has given, essentially, to help in that journey. So, yeah. OK, well, well, I definitely wouldn't say God has given this tool at all. Um, <laughs> I don't know that he actually said that, but I, I would say that it's not from God. However, I think to his point about how he said he's seen it help him, I do think it's possible when somebody is using the Enneagram, they are looking at themselves and thinking about themselves. And so they're going to confront certain issues. And by thinking about those issues or talking about them, 
um, that may lead them to some understanding about themselves. I could, you can do that with astrology as well. So what I would say is any benefits that he has seen in his life, that's exactly what people who use astrology say. Now, if we're going to use that as the basis for using it, if it's going to be experience that is the factor in saying something should be used or something is valid, then we're going to have to say astrology is valid because you're going to have more people. You're going to have many more people who say astrology has helped them than the Enneagram because astrology has more adherence around the world and has been around longer is, you know, it's just been there more. So there's just millions of fans of astrology. Um, you know, if I could gather up all of my astrological clients and all of my astrologer friends and their clients, you know, we would definitely probably outvote all the Enneagram people in the church as to what, <laughs> as to how helpful something is. So what I'm basically saying is we should, as Christians, we should not base truth on experience. We should not base it on, well, this helped me, therefore it must be valid because I still say that that self-deception is a factor. And of course, you're going to say self-deception is not what's happening because you, first of all, you're not going to want to say that. And secondly, you don't you don't know that that's what it is. That's why it's called self-deception. So, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to I don't want to say I'm not trying to make Todd look negative here in his enthusiasm for the Enneagram. So forgive me if I'm if I'm coming across too negative to you, Todd. I really am just using what you said to make a point that we should not base truth on experience. That's exactly what New Agers do. And that's what I did as a new ager. Well, this helped me, therefore it's valid. And one of the things I constantly told skeptics about astrology, because I did come across skeptics, including my father, who was an agnostic um, and was kind of horrified that his daughter was an astrologer. <laughs> um, you know, I said I wouldn't do this if I didn't think it helped people and if I didn't see results in people's lives and if people didn't tell me it helped them. So if we're going to use that as the basis, since Todd's admitted that it doesn't have any psychological validity or scientific validity, then we have to go to experience as the way to say it's valid. And that, to me, is not the criteria for a Christian. And if we're going to use that criteria, then we're going to have to say astrology is valid as well. Uh, a response as well, Todd, and then we'll start to wrap things up. Yeah, sure. Oh, I, well, I... I, I... Of course, I'm not saying that the Enneagram is valid because it's it based on experience or I'm not trying to uh, what I am saying. You asked the question, has it been experientially val helpful? And I'm, my answer is yes. Right. Um, it is the case that Christians do look to experience as a source of truth. Go to Wesley's quadrilateral, for example, a kind of famous theological framework from John Wesley. that truth is derived from four different sources for Christians. Scripture as the main one, tradition reason and experience fourthly so it's it's not accurate to say that christians don't base truth on experience it's that it's not only on experience and that experience doesn't trump scripture I so i i just don't want to like dis, quote unquote dismiss experience at all um and again um i i'm not claiming the the enneagram is a scientific tool i'm claiming it's a wisdom tradition it's chocked full of wise insights into human living and I fully affirm that the, the dubious, sketchy origins and current use by many people of the Enneagram. I, I affirm all of that. I get all of that and see all of that. Um, so it's not, I mean, I, and I'm happy to affirm as well that it's not a neutral tool that just kind of is a free floating apart from any philosophical context or associations with New Age. But I do think it can it can be neutralized, right? So Marsha's point is it's not a neutral tool. And I'm saying, yeah, no, it's not a neutral tool. The, the question for me is, can it be neutralized? Or, or uh, the way I put it in the book, Justin, is can it be transposed into a Christian key is the way I put it. You can't just take the Enneagram and drop it into Christianity. But can you transpose it into a Christian key by doing some theological and philosophical moves that not only neutralize it, but actually put it to Christian purposes. But this may be the fundamental kind of hermeneutical and philosophical difference, maybe even theological difference between Marcia and I. Uh, I'm a Wheaton College, evangelical, liberal arts, all truth is God's truth. 
I am a hundred million miles away from a fundamentalist in the way I approach all of life, including ideas of evolutionary biology and a lot of other things. So I've already got a major disposition that is for trying to find things in the world that are true and appropriate them for Christian purposes. And it doesn't scare me at all that they have either non-Christian associations or origins. I suspect Marcia, Marcia is going to be less Wheaton College evangelical in that sense, and perhaps more fundamentalist. And I do not mean that as a, as a slur or a critique. I mean that more as a philosophical, theological, hermeneutical statement. So it would be interesting to ask, would you go yeah. to a yoga studio and do yoga, or do you believe in evolutionary biology? And if the answer would be no, I believe in six day earth creationism, that would be reflective of a whole philosophical, theological, hermeneutical approach to learning and ideas that I just have a totally different approach to. Well, I agree that all, that all truth is God's truth. And so my point is that I think yoga is in a different category because that's not a question of truth. Um, I think here we're dealing with a question of truth. If a tool that is supposed to tell you who you are based on nine categories is not psychologically valid, to me, there is no basis for calling it a wisdom tradition and there's no basis for transposing it into a Christian key. And in Todd's words, those are his, his words. Uh, there's no basis for taking something that doesn't have validity. I, I, if, if, if that's okay, then we can take astrology. And we can transpose that into a Christian key. I mean, it has as much validity as the Enneagram. There's no, you know, there's there's no reason to say it has less validity um, in terms of it telling you who you are. I'm not talking about foretelling or prediction. Well, well look, we, we, it's probably time to wrap this up. So, so chance for, <laughs> for a final thought from both of you. Uh, I, I guess, Todd, you know, um, for you, obviously. Well, we've we've heard throughout, you know, that, that you do believe there's a value to this that, yes. that Christians can use it wisely and it yes. can actually be transformative. I mean, do yep. do you believe it is going to be continuing to be picked up more widely by the church? Something you'd welcome, I assume, if it is. Yeah, I do think it probably will continue to be picked up by the church. But you know, ideas like this are faddish. I mean, I don't think it's going to last for fifty years. I mean, I think it'll cycle through. Uh, my part of my hope from today's conversation is that Marsha will become a big fan of my book, <laughs> which is which is a way of saying Marsha will go will look out on evangelicalism and say millions of evangelical Christians are gravitating to the Enneagram. And as you do that, I don't think you should, Marsha might say. But if you do that, you should go get Todd Wilson's book because he's a theologically <laughs> responsible pastor theologian who's going to help you do it with at least some semblance of Christian credibility. But don't go get Don Hudson and Rizzo, Rizzo Hudson and Roar. Go get Wilson. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So I'm trying to, I'm trying to like appropriate this stuff so that it, it is coherent in Christian faith. Marsha may say, "Oh, it doesn't work at the end of the day." And I say, "Well, okay, that's fine. We're going to disagree." But, I, but I think for a lot of evangelical Christians, they've read my book and they're like, "Wow, that really helped me make sense of it from a Christian theological perspective. That's really helpful. I don't need to become a Gnostic." If I use the Enneagram, I can still believe in original sin and, and still use the Enneagram. Wow, this is lovely. That would be my goal and hope, Justin. And I hope Marcia would cheer me on in that effort. Do you, do you, Marcia? I can't, I can't cheer anyone on in the Enneagram. I'm sorry, Todd. <laughs> I, I oh, that's fine. You. But you don't, you don't believe in personality, so so we're going to be. I respect your your desire to use it in a way that you know, as you see it, would be a Christian way and, and, and staying away from any new age ideology. So I respect your efforts in yes. that, in that, and I respect your, you know, that you're not there saying Richard Rohr is everybody ought to go get Richard Rohr's book, which I've heard many Enneagram teachers recommend. Yes, indeed. So you're at least, I, I agree yeah, with you on that, least, Marcia. Thank you. you. Know, yes, on that exactly. page with me. So I, I, I am, you know, I'm glad to hear that. I really am. But I just think that I think that I have seen damage from the Enneagram um, and many people have told me about it. Um, 
because it, for ver there are various reasons that it seems to have been destructive to some Christians. And I think ultimately what it's doing, and not for everybody that uses it, not for maybe Todd, Todd or the people who read his book, but certainly a lot of Christians are beginning to use the Enneagram as the way to understand how to be a Christian when actually it should be the words in, in, in the Bible that tell us how to grow in Christ. And it says in Second uh, Peter chapter 1, the first few verses, it's his divine power has given us the ability for all godliness and knowledge. So it's the divine power of God that gives us what we need to grow as Christians the way God wants us to grow. And I don't think the Enneagram is needed, nor do I think it's helpful. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to, we're you know, we definitely did not come to any agreement on the Enneagram. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I want to say. But, I, but it was done. It was done. I think the arguments that the Enneagram is sounds like pentagram or looks funny are terrible arguments. And I've discouraged um, people on my pages, for example, on Facebook, I said, please don't use that argument because that's a completely invalid, <laughs> ridiculous argument. Um, you know, that has it has nothing to do with a pentagram. It's just the word gram, which means drawing in Greek. OK, so don't use I, that. Ha argument. Hands up. That was me using the worst don't argument, use that argument of, of the whole the show. Then. <laughs> um, but look, it's been it's been it's been great, though, and I do appreciate the the, the way you've both you know handled this even though you obviously have a, a significant difference of opinion sorry todd you wanted to add one i thing. was just gonna say i don't know that i i, I don't think it's quite accurate having done an, a, an hour now of dialogue with marcia i don't think it's quite accurate to say we disagree about the enneagram i think it's more accurate to say we disagree about much more fundamental philosophical and even theological Maybe. and mm -hmm. hermeneutical approaches which then informs the way we because i think we could come on next time and talk about evolutionary biology and have a very spirited conversation about oh my gosh evolutionary biology is counter the christian faith and i would argue no it's not at all it can be appropriated by Christ and i think that, so i think that's what's going on here yeah we don't have time to open that particular can of worms today We're out of time, <laughs> I, don't anyway. have, I don't have good scientific knowledge so i wouldn't do it <laughs> well look we've got plenty of other debates on unbelievable where we have some spirited conversations on uh the validity of uh of evolution and so on so um we'll leave those for another time but for the moment um again just just to remind you todd wilson's book uh it's called the enneagram goes to church published by ivp uh marcia montenegro is the author of richard raw and the enneagram secret and there are links to both of them from today's show but for now todd and marcia thank thanks you. for being with me thanks so much thank you justin hey. and thank you marcia thank, great to be thank with you, with you todd yeah it was good to be on with both of you guys for more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.